Hello and welcome to the Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church Bible Study for the 15th of June 2021. Today we're starting a new series in the book of Titus. So let's open up God's word. If you're not familiar where Titus is, he comes after Timothy, 1 and 2 Timothy, and before Philemon and Hebrews. Titus was written by the Apostle Paul to a young man, a fellow worker who was to serve God's people in Crete. Let's read and then let's ask God to help us to understand his word. So our reading is Titus 1, chapter 1 and verses 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords to godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Saviour, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you once more. We come to your word. We come to hear your voice. We come dependent on the help of your Holy Spirit to teach us your ways. Father, give us understanding. Lord, renew our minds. Stir our joy and desire, our delight in you. And teach us your ways that we might also obey you and be word people, gospel people who live for your glory in this world that needs Christ. So would you speak to us now? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Imagine that you, or perhaps your husband or dad or brother, were sent to lead a new church on an island in the Mediterranean Sea. Sounds like a pastoral job from paradise. Sounds like it's a great church to be. Send your time by the sea in nice warm weather. But this church has a problem with false teaching. Lots of the members were lazy, and some of them ate too much. Some were interested in fake news. Some of the older sisters were getting drunk, and the younger sisters and the younger men were living ungodly lives. Some people were stealing from their bosses. Others were so rebellious and critical of the government of Crete that they were attracting the attention of the authorities and people were complaining that the church were, were not good citizens of that area. And others were arguing about detailed matters of Christian doctrine and were using that arguing to seek to divide the true believers. This was no paradise. This was a mess. And if you were there, what would you want to help you? This is Titus, the pastor. We don't know for how long, probably a quite a short period. But the pastor that Paul, he says in verse five, I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. This letter is the help that God is going to give Titus. This letter is the word of God through Paul. 
And it's a word of God that he needs in order to be effective in building the local church there in Crete. In God's mercy to us, he's caused this inspired letter to be preserved so that we can hear God's voice about church, about leadership, about correcting false teaching, about living in godly families, living godly in our families and living godly at work, living as good citizens, being grounded in the truth, being assured of our salvation and living godly lives that reflect the gospel and make the gospel attractive and also being preserved in unity as the local church. Now I'm not sure how the format of midweek meetings is going to work in the coming months. Indeed I'm recording this a little early ahead of the announcement by the government about whether or not there will be a fuller or even a total reopening on the 21st of June. So we don't know exactly what the future will hold. But we're going to start, at the very least, this wonderful book of Titus and see what the Lord will teach us through it. I've only read the first four verses. We're starting a very good place to start at the beginning. But what a beginning. What a beginning. He, Titus, is shown the purpose of his ministry, the glories of the gospel and the God who never lies. And whatever the coming months hold for us, this is a firm, solid foundation that we can rest upon. Firstly, in this greeting, we see the minister in verse 1. Now, this kind of greeting is common in Paul's day. Those of you old enough to remember pen and paper letters, you, unless you recognise the handwriting, would always, in letters, have to turn to the back page to see who the letter was from. Now, of course, we have emails and we know at the top who it's from, similarly with text messages. But we don't have this kind of lengthy greeting. But this was common for Paul's day, in which the sender would say something about themselves in the greeting and also something about the person that they're writing to. And this is what we see here. The minister, Paul, he says, a servant of God. Now, the English Standard Version is a bit more polite than the Greek. The Greek word that we got here translated as servant is the Greek word for a bond servant, a servant owned, or in other words, a slave. Paul is saying that he belongs to God, that he is not his own, that he is therefore at God's command. He has a, tr in a job, he is entrusted with something to do. As it says at the end of verse 3, I have been entrusted by the command of God our Saviour. He's not a free agent. He belongs to the Lord God Almighty. Scripture uses the image of being set free from slavery, being redeemed, but also being owned by Jesus Christ. So, for example, if you look in Romans 6, and verses 17 to 18, it says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. We now belong to him, not just Paul, but you and I. If you are a Christian, You've been set free from slavery to sin, but now you belong to Jesus Christ to do his will and to follow his commandments. But notice Paul is also, it says back in Titus 1 verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word apostle is sent one. 
Now, there's a sense in which we are all sent by Jesus as his servants to live in this world as his witnesses. But Paul is using the word apostle in the sense of those commissioned directly, personally, face to face by Jesus Christ. As Paul was with a supernatural appearance on the road to Emmaus. And the job of the apostles, those original apostles, was to lay the foundation of the early church, to preach a gospel to a world who had never heard of Jesus, and therefore to attest to that word through signs and wonders. And also part of the foundational ministry was to reveal the will of God and record that for us in scripture. So that's the minister, but there's also a second minister in this introduction. And we find him in verse four. To Titus, my true child in a common faith. This is suggesting that Titus has come to faith through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. We don't know that for certain, but we know that he uses similar language about Timothy, who also it seems that Paul was instrumental in leading to Christ. But Paul wasn't simply a minister who would say, well, we've had X number of conversions or professions of faith. He is one who is concerned for discipleship and encouraging uh, those who come to Christ to live lives of service and those who are called who to live lives of what nowadays we call full-time service in terms of ministering in the local churches. And we find him spoken of in the book of 2 Corinthians as one who ministered with Paul and also in Galatians as the one who went up to Jerusalem with Paul when Paul shared his call with the other apostles there in Jerusalem. He is, we'd say nowadays, one of Paul's ministry team. And he's sent here to Crete, as we've seen when we look forward at verse 5, to put what remained into order and to appoint elders in every town as I directed you. He has this special mission to be the, uh, a, a, an early pastor of this local church or local churches on the island of Crete to build up these local churches. They, they become biblical churches and free from the things that I spoke about earlier on. So that's the minister. The second thing we see is the mission, the mission, picking up halfway through verse one. It says, for the sake of of the faith of God's elect. Let's pause there for a moment. And this is both Paul and Timothy. He's referring to his ministry primarily, but Titus now has to carry on that role on the island of, of Crete. And he speaks here about God's elect. That Paul's mission is to bring God's chosen people to know the Lord and to enable them to live for him. Now, we're not to be put off by this phrase, God's elect, because people say, oh, that's just unfair because there are those who are not God's elect, and what about them? Well, we need to understand something very important, that every single person who walks this earth is a sinner, who is out, has fallen short of God's glory, and deserves the holy, righteous justice of God. And yet, despite the fact that no one deserves to be saved, God in his mercy reaches down and rescues people from spiritual, being spiritually dead, of being slaves to sin, unable even to turn to him. And he reaches, as well as unwilling to turn to him, and he reaches down and rescues them 
and opens their eyes and breathes life into them by the Holy Spirit so that then faith arises and they call upon the name of the Lord Jesus willingly, joyfully, and are saved. It is a God's work. And that's why it's spoken of God's elect. God chose Israel in the Old Testament and God still chooses people with amazing grace, overcoming grace, sets them free and sets them on uh, the on the right path turn they turn around to Jesus and they are saved now we don't know among the people of West Norwood or wherever you are if you're watching this elsewhere we don't know who those people are we're commanded to go and make disciples of all nations and so we go out but we go out with the confidence that God has a people that he's going to call to himself. Paul had this ex had an experience in Corinth that he speaks about when he, he tells us that he, um, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, sorry, not in 1 Corinthians, in Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 18 and verses 9 and 10. And it says, the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have in this city, I have many in this city who are my people. And so Paul had a confidence to preach the word, knowing that God would save some. And the same is true among us in our communities, in our families, in our workplaces, on the mission field, there are people whom God is going to call to himself. And so we can go out boldly. And Paul's ministry as a foundation lying, sorry, a foundation laying apostle was to preach and to build local churches so that those who become Christians are able to fellowship together, hear God's word and be built up. And now Titus is to continue that job for their benefit. He is to equip the local church and enable them, as it says in chapter 2 and verse 10, to adorn the doctrine or adorn the gospel of God our Saviour. For they're taught not only what to believe but how to live as they live as God's chosen people, separate from the world, living godly before this world. So God has a people, and if you put your trust in Christ, you are one of them. But God's people need to believe in him. So Paul says, for the sake of the faith of God's elect. And this has to do with saving faith as we pick up in uh, the next phrase their knowledge of the truth in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4 it speaks of God's desire for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth that is God's heart for people that's why we are here and we're not in heaven we have a mission to preach the gospel and so the the work of Paul as the, the, the layer of the, the foundation of the local church and now the work of Titus as the pastor and indeed the work of the congregation and now our work in our day is to testify to the truth so that people come to a knowledge of the truth. We are to be witnesses. But there's also a sense here. This is not just talking about initial saving faith but an ongoing building up of faith. The, 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 the mission of, of the, the, the church, the mission of the leadership, and indeed of all of us toward one another, is that we're building one another up in our faith, growing stronger in faith, appreciating the gospel more and more, loving him and living for his glory. And this comes on, uh, in the next phrase, sitting in verse one, the, their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. 
And so this is not simply being able, as we did a couple of Sundays ago, to read and uh, and declare the Apostles' Creed, saying, yes, we, we know that, that, that we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and we believe in his Son, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, and we believe in the forgiveness of sins and all these things. Yes, we do, and we should, but actually the truth changes lives. We are set free to walk in godliness. And that, again, is why the ongoing teaching of the word of God is necessary. And indeed, if there's no godliness, there may well be no true conversion, no true faith. And as we've been looking at Saul the king in 1 Samuel, the question remains over his life, and we'll see this in coming weeks, was when it it, it said that, that, that he became a, a, a changed man, a new man, was that simply enabling for service or was he truly converted? And where was the fruit if Saul was truly converted? I mean, to challenge ourselves and hear this call to walk godly. But flowing now into verse two, in hope of eternal life. Being a Christian is not simply to live this life. This is not our best life now. Our best life is to come. Eternal life. Hope in biblical terms is an absolute sure, certain confidence. God, as it goes on to say in verse two, never lies. So when we are promised eternal life if we put our trust in Jesus Christ then that is what we have and is absolutely assured it's eternal it lasts forever but it's eternal also in the sense it comes from God we are born anew we are born from heaven we are made alive together with Christ we have his life within us and that's the life that lasts forever and it's that assurance that means we have been able in 2020 and 2021 to face the realities of covid to face the disappointments and the sorrow to face the loss of loved ones to be aware of our frailty to realize that what he is on earth is not forever but we have that assurance and hope of eternal life. So the minister, Paul and also Titus, the mission to see people come to Christ, to see them built up, to see them live godly and to remind them, establish them in that hope of eternal life. Now we'll, we'll jump forward to, to verse three. We'll come back to the rest of verse two in a couple of moments. The means, the means is God's word. Now God, it says end of verse, verse two, that God has promised his hope of eternal life before ages began. It's always been his plan to have a people in glory for all eternity. But the, the, the means is the coming of Jesus because this was manifested virtually at the proper time, but that is now communicated in his word now uh, the, the the word here is for word is is logos so uh, perhaps paul is referring to the logos in the sense that john means that, that that jesus christ is the word of god he is a true revelation of the father but it's more likely because logos is a, a john word but he's talking about the proclamation of the, the christ through the word of god and of course, he had the Old Testament scriptures who declared Christ. And you see him in Acts, uh, reasoning from the scriptures, proving that Jesus is the Christ. And so he proclaimed it. But as the apostle, he was also able to proclaim the gospel and bring the revelation that we have recorded for us in the, the epistles he wrote. The very words of God. So the means that God uses is... The word of God. This word is given to Paul, it says, 
in on trust through the preaching with which I have been entrusted. Now we have been entrusted. We're not apostles in that sense. We're not those foundational people uh, uh, personally appointed by the Lord Jesus Christ. But we all have the word of God and therefore we're all able to share the word of God. And if you're a believer, you are part of verse one, God's elect who've come to the knowledge of the truth which courts to godliness and you have the hope of eternal life and the means by which your faith is built up and your life is challenged to live godly is through the word of God. If we are to be a true church and faithful members of the church, we need to be a people of the word of God who love it, read it, hear it, study it, meditate upon it, pray it, live it and share it. And we are entrusted with this. And we can be un unfaithful to that trust in three ways. We can firstly fail to proclaim the gospel at all. Or we can proclaim the gospel but not live lives, it says, the faith, the truth that accords to godliness, not live lives which actually reflect the gospel, or we can preach a false gospel. May we not do any of those things. May we be faithful to share the true word and live according to it because we are grounded in his truth. And that is the way we will see our communities transformed. It's fantastic to have practical ways of connecting with the community, different outreaches, coffee mornings, community days, uh, parent and toddler groups. All these things are good, but they're only so good as they provide opportunity for us to share the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what will save. That is what will bring people to faith. And that is what will build people in their faith. It's a tall order. It's a huge challenge. But we have a great and glorious foundation. To be, though his ministers, on a mission by means of the word of God, because we have a God who is trustworthy. Back again to verse two. God who never lies, who never lies, promised before ages began. Now we know he promised because it says in Ephesians 1 that he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Again, Ephesians 3, it was God's eternal plan. This was not an accident. We know that God first revealed his plan to save in Genesis by means of the seed of the woman, who we know from the New Testament is Jesus Christ, bruising the head of the serpent. So God has promised this and God is faithful to his promises and God never lies. Some versions have God who cannot lie. The, the sense of the phrase is the unlying God. He is utterly, utterly trustworthy. And so as we are his ministers, as we have this mission to see people come to faith and to build their faith and also for ourselves to grow. And as we have the means of God's word, we stand upon a God who is unlying and who keeps his promises and that includes a promise to be with us until the end of the age, never to leave us nor forsake us. Lord, the, the promise that he will uh, open the eyes of those who he's going to save. The fact he has people in our communities who will come to faith and he, he will work in their life to save them means that we can trust him. We can trust him with everything else that would might hinder our mission. 
and us using the word of God to bring about that mission where we've got doubts and discouragement. We can go and see in his word that he is trustworthy. When we're battered by the storms of life, we can stand on the promises of the God who is trustworthy. And when we doubt that people are going to be saved, we can see that it says at the end of verse three that he is God, our saviour. And again, at the end of verse four, Christ Jesus, our saviour. He is saviour. Here we have the unity of the Godhead. And indeed, later on, um, people, uh, sorry, Titus rather refers, for example, in in chapter 2, verse 13, our great God and saviour, Jesus Christ. So we have this unity of the Godhead, this affirmation of the deity of Christ and the heart of God is to save. We sing that song, don't we? Hear the heart of heaven beating. Jesus saves. And because he's the unlying God, he's not suddenly going to become the God who doesn't save. And so we can faithfully and boldly be involved in this mission to build up each other's faith in the local church, to encourage each other to godliness, to build our hope of eternal life that we rest assured no matter what the storms of life are and that we're also proclaiming that message to the world around knowing that God has his people knowing that people will come to know him through the ministry of his word that we can be willing servants like Paul and Titus that we can ourselves grow in the knowledge of the truth and we can be a people of the word because he is the unlying God every word is trustworthy and we can lean upon him who keeps his promises so may God help us to be his ministers fulfill his mission by means of his word because he is the unlying God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for these things. Help us to trust you. Help us to minister your word. Help us to grow in our knowledge of the truth. Help us to grow in godliness and help us to bring people to faith for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just a few suggestions for prayer. And as I've said, I am uh, bringing this before uh, the the date of the 15th of June, recording this rather. So we may well be in a position now where everything's opening up on the 21st of June. But nonetheless, so if we are, you might need to change what you pray for. But there are still things that are uh, not affected by time that we can pray for. And the first is to thank God that he doesn't lie, to worship him for his promises, to thank him for the gospel and to pray for the gospel preaching of Lansdowne or your local church, to pray for the Sunday services or the online services, to pray for the ministry to young people, to pray for outreach into the community. And to pray for your own gospel witness. It's not just for Paul or the pastor or the elders or the evangelists that you know. This is for all of us. Now, Landon is in London. So let's pray for the work of the London City Mission. And for their work reaching people from other cultures and faiths. Let's also pray that God would use what is going on at the moment, Euro 2020, as opportunity for churches and ministries where there are football stadiums to share the good news of Jesus. Let's continue to pray for our nation and the real uh, hot spots around the world like India where the virus is still very very dangerous and pray for God to use COVID-19 
to help people to realise they need that eternal hope. And finally, let's pray for needs within our own local church. The Lord bless you in abundance and thank you for listening.